I've called my talk tonight something uh, that I've been working on, which uh, I, I think will develop as a report, hopefully this year. Um, and it's called Fast Money, Slow Capital. You've heard about slow food, and of course, you've heard about, in the United States, they talk about slow money. Of course, that, that's taking off over here in different shapes and sizes. But actually, I think the solution is actually two different things, fast money and slow capital. And I'll explain what I mean by that. So I've talked about seeds for sea change. In the book that um, I wrote, and it's come out uh, four or five months ago, called The Resilience Imperative, the subtitle is called Cooperative Transitions to a Steady State Economy. And the resilience imperative is about the ecological principles of resilience. And we've tried in the book to link that to the seven cooperative principles. Uh, and that creates um, a new approach to the economy, which has two eyes, not just one. And the two eyes are really social economics. The other eye is ecological economics. Because I've worked with New Economics Foundation since the very beginning, when it was just kind of starting up as a volunteer. And I think what's troubled me over the years is, what is New Economics? <laughs> what really is it? And in my journey, I think I found a clarity of that question, uh, that it relates to a kind of a social and ecological economics. And that's some of the things I'll be talking about. But sea change is, is, is about social and ecological economics that unites the... Um, because often it's the social justice folks and the environmental justice folks that don't talk. They have their backs to each other and they're going in different directions where they should come together, have two eyes, and make sea change. So, that's by way of introduction. So, let's begin. Okay, if you look at the state of um, the planet in relationship to sheer injustice, it is obscene, the level of inequality. It's, you know, it's a total disgrace. That the shares of global financial wealth, for the top half percent of the population, is, owns 35.6% of, of, of wealth. And um, the bottom 68.4% in terms of GDP owns, uh, controls about 4.2%. The asset disparity between the rich and poor has never been greater in history. The top 1,000 billionaires are worth, worth more than 1.5 billion poorest citizens on the planet, which is a, a, you know, about a quarter of the population. Richest three billionaires have assets equal to the GDP of the 48 poorest countries. <laughs> so we're talking about something that the disparity was never seen you know, in the ancient regime of France before the French Revolution happened. There was never such an inequality ever before as those facts and figures. And why is that the case? Well, that's what I'll try to illuminate. Okay, so we've had this period of financial deregulation of markets, particularly since the late 70s. And that has actually changed the picture. So if you went back to the 1960s, um, the um, finance industry at that time, um, 50 years ago, um, uh, accounted for about 14% of global profits. But then really, since the deregulation of financial services with Reaganomics, uh, beginning in the uh, late 70s, early 80s, we've had this uh, change. So there's more of a doubling, as you can see, almost a trebling of the share of um, global corporate profits by the banking industry. Um, of course, do the bank, are, are the banks making houses? Are they making any? What are they making? Okay, well, that's the question. So the bird in the nest has got rather bigger. Um, and so we have this problem of the casino economy, which is eclipsing reality. So if you look at the real economy, and some of you might have heard my friend Mary <laughs> Meller talk uh, before in, one, in these Earth Talks a year, last year, real economics in terms of actually making things for people's needs. It's about 60 trillion um, turnover dollars. But um, the casino economy is more than 10 times that, 750 trillion. 
So how do we explain the, the difference between the real and the casino? That's the key question. You know, what, is the, what is the reason for this? Okay. Anyone who is a lender, a serious lender, there is a rule in banking. It's called the Rule of 72. And it's called flipping a loan. And the way it works is a very simple thing to do mathematically. The time required to double a debt is calculated by dividing the compound interest rate into 72. And then you, you, you can see how much money you can make by making a loan. So if you lend a, make a loan out at 2%, to double in size, it will take 36 years. If you make a loan at 4%, you can see, obviously, it's cutting down. And of course, it, it, at 24%, you can flip it very fast. Okay? And bankers know this. Money lenders know this. It's been known since the Greek times. But not many people outside banking know it, the rule of 72. So, but what is the reality in this country? This country uh, abolished um, uh, ceilings on uh, what you could charge for credit in the 70s. And what's happened? We're one of the only countries in the OECD apart from, Ru <coughs> apart from Russia that doesn't have any ceiling on what we can charge people for credit. So this is figures from 2012. Credit card rates you can see there. Very expensive and you can, for poor people you can get 50% plus on your credit card. Pawn brokers with secured lending is close to 100%. Money lenders who collect on the doorstep in poor areas, charging those figures there. Payday lenders that have been in the press a lot of late, like Wonga, charging 2,000 to 4,000. But the one a, a legal lender was in the press just last week, charging 16 million percent for a one-month loan <laughs> to poor people. But even middle-class people are. Are, are shaken down. They don't realize they're shaken down by the banks. Because if you actually, and I, I worked in debt counseling for years, we were involved in setting up national debt line and business debt line in Birmingham and debt trading units. So I've dealt with this, you know, since I was a young man. And, and, but a lot of people don't know that the, lead, the law in the country does not mean that the bank has to tell you what the APR is on an overdraft. So they have to tell you if you go and borrow a term <coughs> loan for a car or a credit card. But they don't have to tell you with the overdraft because that's exempt uh, from the legislation. So they don't tell you. And what the BBC has exposed is that there are rates that banks are charging middle class people flipping loans at 800,000%. 800, because of what you borrow for a short period of time, you'd be well advised to use your credit card and not use your overdraft. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's ways that, that, that the banks make a lot of money on the quiet. Hazel, uh, sorry, uh, Margaret Kennedy, who wrote a really interesting book about 10 years ago called Interest and Inflation Free Money, she's a German a colleague of mine. Um, she's uh, been campaigning for uh, uh, solutions to compound interest. Because if you actually look at what actually happens, if it, in a system based on interest, which, 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 which is our economy, um, the rich gain and the poor lose. So basically what she's shown, this is based on research in Germany, that on average, 35% of the cost of essential services um, is actually what you buy in the price. Right? So when you're buying something, most manufactured goods have an embedded amount of interest in the cost equation. And that actually is constantly moving that interest through the goods you're buying, whether it's housing, or, or what you're buying, um, you know, or even public services like, for example, collecting the waste. That is actually going out of the system. And it means that basically uh, it, the top 10% of people are benefiting, and the, certainly the top 20%, and 80% of the population are losing in the UK. Yeah? So actually it's a, shift, it's a shift of wealth from um, the bottom 80% to the top 10%. And of course the poor tend to pay the most. Um, this is an interesting character, um, David Stockman. He was a, uh, the, the main speechwriter for President Reagan. This is a man on the conservative side, uh, a Republican. And he wrote a book called The Great Deformation. Because here he was, you know, he was a Republican. He worked for Reagan. He could see what you know, Wall Street was doing. And he could see the, clap, clap, uh, the, the, the catastrophe. 
And so he wrote this thing about the Great Deformation, how turbocharged capitalism has corrupted markets and democracy. And what did he mean? Well, here's some facts. These are figures that I got from Ed Mayo from Co-ops UK, who used to work for the National Consumer Council and then became Consumer Focus, which is a national regulatory body for consumers in this country. This is mainly from research that they did or the Office of Fair Trading did, so these are official figures. So banking, in terms of the great deformation, the banking and the consumer detriment is something that we're paying for really heavily. So the pension mis-selling scandal is 13.5 billion lost to households. Payment protection insurance on loans that the banks are doing and now they're having to pay back for is 13 billion rising. Oligopoly, because of their, we only have basically five banks. <coughs> Nobody talks about monopoly anymore, but basically, okay, it's, it's a cartel. Uh, is lack of competition is costing us an eight, eight, extra eight billion. Payment overcharging to small businesses between three billion and five billion a year, Crookshank review. Excess charging on bank overdrafts, I told you about, 2.6 billion. Latest scams, interest rate swaps for small business, 1.5 billion. And the fixing of library, well, we never know. We may never know about what that, what, of, what that, what, of what that detriment was because it's very difficult to assess it. Frederick Soddy, uh, he, won, he, was, he taught at Oxford, he won the Nobel Prize for chemistry f with Rutherford um, for um, uh, nuclear chemistry. Uh, in the 1920s, um, he became a bit of a heretic, but he was a, uh, Herman Daly writes about him in his book, Beyond Growth, um, because he was really, I think, probably along with maybe Ruskin in some ways, um, and Celia Gazelle, who we'll talk about, were pioneers of ecological economics, practically. So he said, taking from Ruskin, wealth is life. <laughs> yeah? Wealth is life. Wealth is nature. Wealth is human beings. It's not, it's not something that's gold and silver, that's kind of inert and dead. You know? Certainly not paper. Okay? Wealth is life, and the real source of life is sunshine. That was the quote from his book, Wealth is Sunshine. That all, 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 all life depends on sunshine. Mm. So... Um, so he was trying to develop an economics that actually was actually uh, to completely consistent with ecology and natural principles. So he says in his book, um, and I'll show you the title of the book in a moment, he wrote in 1926, usury defies the law of thermodynamics. We need basically 100% money that's debt free. Economic growth based on the squandering of fossil fuels needs to develop uh, you know, we need to develop the solar economy. How do we do this? And he was writing about this almost 100 years ago. Mm. And he was a physicist, and he just applied physical understanding of thermodynamics to the money system, and he came up with an actual a design flaw. He said, debts are subject to the laws of mathematics rather than physics. Unlike wealth, life, which is subject to the laws of thermodynamics, in other words, we grow, we level off in size, and eventually we die, okay? Um, so we have a natural curve, and then we hear, and then, of course, that happens with anything over time. Uh, debts do not rot with age. They gain per annum by the well-known mathematical laws of simple and compound interest. So the drawing on the book shows you that, okay? Well, you have an exponential curve there. That's cancerous growth, okay? What you have is the green line, is the natural curve, okay? So we have to actually have an economy which is actually based on a natural curve, okay? That's a, that's a natural economy, okay? We don't have that. We ha have something that's at variance with thermodynamics. So how would we get there? Uh, usury is as old as the hills. Um, the laws against usury originate from ancient Greece. Um, and there's a famous story, of course. They had a crisis of oil then, but it was olive oil. <laughs> okay. uh, what was happening was olive oil was like liquid gold in, in the Mediterranean, you know, um, well before Christ was born. And there was speculation in land. And of course, because it was worth so much money, um, uh, the olive oil market... Uh, uh, and, of course, uh, olives take a long time to grow and to harvest. And, they, and you, if you know anything about olives, you harvest them every two years. And 
my daughter-in-law is from Calabria, you know, sometimes I've gone down to try to help them. So there was a sharecropping system, basically. And uh, if the harvest isn't good enough and you have to wait so long, um, you borrow, obviously, working capital. And then you, you kind of find yourself behind. And, and then, of course, you lose your land, don't you? Uh, as, uh, or you lose your use rights and you get thrown off the land. So there was this problem with uh, the sweating of these workers. And there was a revolt by the farmers against the olive merchants who were also lenders. And, of course, it, it, it became a kind of a civil war situation. And so there was re reforms to bring peace by Solon in 594 BC, and they had a jubilee release. Okay, so they had to cancel the debt, end the debt bondage, because people could never get out of debt. It was impossible. So they had to actually just wipe the slate clean. And the, you get the kind of, with Solon, you get the beginnings of what became Athenian democracy. So, and of course, Graeber has written his book about um, 5,000 years of debt. Uh, so you have debt, debt slavery made illegal by the Solon reforms, debt-free coinage introdu introduced, low-cost loans extended to farmers. Of course, Aristotle then analyzes this from the point of view of his philosopher in his book on politics. And, he said, and so he said, actually, we do, should not have usury because money is barren. Nothing. It's, you know, it is actually just a, thing, a piece of metal, whatever it is, it's barren. So it doesn't need to earn rent, okay? Uh, so, you know, and then, of course, then that gets picked up in the Middle Ages by um, Thomas Aquinas and others. And then, of course, we have usury laws coming into the mid middle, middle Ages here in Europe. You know, if you look at the, we look at the history of usury laws, uh, what we've seen is an interesting change. So, of course, it was legal for Christians to lend interest. Of course, that was not the case for Jews. And, of course... Uh, um, Jews were allowed uh, to, to be the money lenders, and it was very good for the king for that to happen until the king owed him too much money, and then of course there was a clearance, literally. Um, the Jews were cleared out of England um, in the Middle Ages um, because they, they, they had too much credit on the king. Henry VIII, of course, in, brings interest in, but sets a ceiling of 10%. Cromwell lowers the ceiling to 6%. Adam Smith, in fact, in The Wealth of Nations said, for small businesses, interest should not ever be more than 5%. Interesting. Yeah. Tell that to George Osborne today. <laughs> he's a free marketeer. What, he, does, he doesn't even know he's Adam Smith. You know, he's been to Cambridge. I mean, what the hell is going on? <laughs> uh, usury um, ceiling was abolished in 1854, and so we moved to a process of deregulation of, of credit. There was, for poor people, the Money Lenders Act ceiling of 48% in 1927. That continued until 1974. So we had a ceiling of, for the poorest. Of, I remember it because I started working in this country in the 80s and I could see this was going on in the, 70, in the 70s. So the Consumer Credit Act abolishes any ceiling, usually pervasive and systematic, as I showed earlier in terms of those obscene rates of interest that are almost impossible to believe. Um, and I, you know, I tell people in Europe, and they just can't believe. Because a lot of countries like Germany, they have ceilings of interest at about 22 24%. What can we learn from the past? What can we learn from our ancestors and our great-grandfathers and our great-great-grandmothers? We can learn a lot. Because in the early stages of the cooperative movement, the first building society was started in Birmingham. I worked in Birmingham for over 30 years and raised kids there and now in mid Wales, but where we worked, there was a, there was a place in Aston, not far from the football ground, Aston Villa, where um, they set up the first billing society. It was set up in a pub in 1775 by a man called Richard Ketley. And he, saw, he said to those workers who were coming in from Wales, coming in from other places to, to work in Birmingham, the early industries, because it was a birth of industry, really, places like Birmingham and Coventry. Um, <coughs> That was in you. Know, if you want to actually kind of make something yourself, don't drink so much beer and actually save money in this beer, in this, in, put your pennies in this mug. And people said, why? So they, they began saving in the pub. <clears throat> and then they would save a lot, and then every, let's say, a year or so, they would draw a lot. They'd take numbers and they would draw a lot and decide who was going to get the first loan. And that loan was given to buy a piece of land 
okay? And they continue to save, and they keep drawing numbers, and then they would get enough money to actually uh, build a house, which they'd self-built, because they had the skills. These people were, uh, you know, they were digging canals, they had lots of ha you know, real working skills. Between them, they had all the skills they needed. So they buy the plot, they build the houses together, and they build them interest-free. They were building their local economy, really interest-free. This idea caught on, and it spread all over the, the, the black country, the, you know, the area around Birmingham. And then it spread all over uh, the, the, the UK. And you know, we had like almost 3,000 building societies 100 years ago. Um, we have like 40 left. Uh, most of them were, were privatized, demutualized. But for the first 100 years, they mostly they were called terminating building sites. They lent without interest. And actually, everyone was guaranteed a house over time. Okay, that was a guarantee. And when everyone had a house, they would wind up the building society because it had served its purpose. It had done its deed. It wasn't needed anymore. Everyone had got a home. So, uh, mutual savings in pubs, very popular. We should do it again. Um, uh, <laughs> for transition. Um, but then, around 1870, they changed the system and they moved to a system of interest charging and they created permanent building societies and that took them in the direction of banks in, in some ways. Okay, it took them away from the mission. But this wasn't the only thing. <clears throat> uh, Robert Owen and a guy called Josiah Warren in the United States, in Ohio, they were involved in early co-op development and they do introduced these things called labor notes, which you might have seen them in the pictures, but they basically based on hours. So it was a bit like time banks, but they were money, they were hand-to-hand -hand money. And of course that was not unusual at the time because until about 1844, every bank in this country printed its own money. So the local bank here in Totnes would have at that time printed its own money, issued its own money. That was common everywhere in what were called country banks. But these co-op banks, were, they were trying to do the same thing but without interest. That was quite a different thing, quite a radical thing to do. And they, based the, they tried to base the money based on labor, like an hour. Because they were, so they were like time banks. And the, the, but they, they didn't succeed so much. But the one in the United States, a couple in the United States and the Midwest actually lasted until the early 1840s. Then, of course, in 1843, in London and elsewhere, they came up with these interest-free saving systems for smaller loans. This spread to Australia, they were called Starbucket Societies. And there was a whole movement in the 19th century to try to create mutual banking without interest in France, in the United States, in Germany. Um, and it, it continued to evolve, mutual banking. Um, and there was this person who was quite an uh, interesting person, he, he's German, who, uh, Sylvia Gazelle. He wrote this book called Natural Economic Order in 1918. I'd been working on this idea since the 1890s. And he said, nature grows and it dies back. Can money do the same? That was interesting. You know, so you know, he was thinking about a natural curve. So we looked at the early co-op labor notes, most of which didn't last very long. You know, during the kind of Great Depression of the 1830s, it lasted for, in London and Birmingham and Brighton, it lasted for a few years and then it died out. The reasons why it died out but it lasted a bit longer in the States. And he said, okay, but the, those labor notes were a bit static, a bit like lets, you know, they, they don't grow very far. Um, so is it possible to actually come up with something that's more dynamic and that has, as, can, and can we make it rust? Because, you know, gold, you know, doesn't rust. How can we make money rust? And his solution was to set speed limits, to, to set a speed within time limits. Okay, so, he came up with what I call fast money. Now, how does it work? So imagine, you know, when you, when you obviously have to park your car at the airport or something like that, let's say. I know it's a very degrowth, a very growth thing to do. But let's say you imagine you go for, you're leaving your car for a while because you're going away to see your relatives in Timbuktu, okay? And, um, <coughs> and so you're leaving it for a month, okay? You then obviously have to pay for it for that period of time. So, he, he really was thinking, well, okay, if, if, if the meter runs out, we have to actually recharge it. How do we do that? So, he came up with this idea of we issue the money for free, and we have a negative interest rate. So, the rate that he recommended was 
5.2% over a year. Okay? And how would that work? Well, I'll explain it to you in a moment. And so this principle was applied in Germany, uh, Denmark, Austria, and the USA, and it was known as stamp money. Why would they call it stamp money? Uh, here was the most famous experiment. And of course, this poor guy died in, 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 in 1930, so he never actually saw the experiment. He died before it happened. But he saw a smaller experiment in Germany in 1926 that worked, but it was in a village. But this was quite a big experiment. I live in Newtown in the middle of Wales, or near Newtown, which is 10,000 people, so it was about the size of Newtown. How many people in Totnes? 10,000, exactly the same. So maybe this is an idea you could take home. Um, at that time, the unemployment in 1932 was 30%. Uh, so the mayor decided to try this uh, stamp money. So he introduced 40,000 what were called free shillings because they gave it away. You know, didn't have to kind of borrow it. They gave it away. It was paid into circulation. But the way that they actually gave it away is that they paid the workers in the town, the public servants, they actually paid the wages, some of the wages were paid that way, and they also decided to invest in, let's say, like building a bridge and planting some forests and creating some jobs that way, so public works. That was the way that they spent the money. And it was paper money, like you know, uh, local currency, the you know, local Stroud pound or whatever. Um, and it was only, but it was only had a life of a, of a month. And actually, at the end of a month, if you had it, it was no good unless you bought another stamp for it. So on the back, you had to buy a 1% stamp. So the charge for the whole year, negative interest rate, was 12%. Okay? Um, so, but what was interesting, opposed to complementary currency, this was real currency because you could pay your taxes with it. Yeah? It wasn't complementary. This was, you could pay your council tax with it. Um, so that was really good because the businesses that got it could spend it by paying their council tax, couldn't they? Or the individuals could pay their share of the council tax. So it increased the velocity of money to a factor of about 10. So it went, you know, went from a factor of about 3 to 10. So it had a big jump. Because people know that they, they, that, that they had this money and it was burning a hole in their pocket if they didn't spend it. So people who wanted their house painted or some, the plumber to do the work, they would pay the plumber in advance. Okay. Yeah, so actually, people, the, so the, the people who are the workers were getting the money paid in advance for a job because they were trusted people to do the job, so that they, did, they got paid before they did the job. So it actually created this velocity. And then it meant the taxes were paid faster, and so it created the circulation. Well, the result was remarkable because it created this local multiplier effect. Unemployment ended uh, very quickly. The roads and the housing were repaired. They repainted the whole town. They built bridges. They, 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 they built a reservoir. There was this huge amount. And so from 30% unemployment, it went to zero pretty much within a year. And then 200 Austrian towns wanted to do the same thing because they all had hardly high unemployment. It was like Spain, you know, uh, or Greece. And so they were gearing up to do this, and then it was banned by the central bank mm -hmm. and they, after about yeah. 15 months. So there was uh, Irving Fisher was a famous uh, economist. He lost a lot of money in the Great Depression in 1929 in October, about a week before the crash, he said, you folks, don't worry, this baby's going to go and go and go. And uh, he, he said that in the New York Times, and about a week later, the whole thing crashed. <laughs> and he lost, he lost a lot of money, and that he had this kind of Pauline conversion. And he's famous because he's developed, he's very economic people, he's a giant. You know, he developed things like net present value, RPI, quantity theory of money, you know, he is a giant of an economist. It just so happens that he was working with this uh, Austrian guy um, in Chicago, at the University of Chicago, uh, called Gazelle. Uh, not Gazelle, but he knew Gazelle, a guy called Corson. And Corson convinced him that he should look at what Gazelle was doing, and Gazellians were doing in Austria. And Irving Fisher got really, really excited by this, and he wrote a book, which you can download, from, from the web, it's, you know, it's a sm short book called Stamp Script, which is a handbook for the United States, the town, small towns and big towns in the United States in the Great Depression, <coughs> to actually um, you know, have their own money, which would be this fast money, the stamp money. And he argued the case to Roosevelt. He said, look, we're getting, we're, you know, it's like here, you know, the debt is growing. You know, here we are, we're five years into uh, this Great Recession. 
the debt had, has, has had grown, it's grown to one trillion in 2008, it's now going to go to 1.5 trillion by 2015, and Mr. Osborne does not have a plan. I mean, I can, I can tell you that for sure. He's, you know, the, the debt's growing and he doesn't have a plan. Uh, and, but Irving Fisher said, hey, Roosevelt, we need a plan, you know, because this is going to get worse and worse and worse unless we come up with a plan. So he said, let's do this stamp script. And Roosevelt t turned to this professor from Harvard called Sprague, and Frog said, no, 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 too dangerous, can't do that. So they never did it. But uh, what, what <clears throat> Irving Fisher recommended was, can you imagine that in 1933 that they should spend in the economy one trillion U.S. dollars as stamp script? That is phenomenal. Now, Obama did that with one tr tr trillion U.S., but, you know, that was such a long time ago. He was serious. You know, if you wanted to actually kick-start it and get things to go again and to deal with this massive structural unemployment, that should be a good thing to do. It was rejected. It never happened. But then he developed his Plan B. He wasn't going to give up, R. Fisher. So he developed the Chicago Plan for Monetary Reform, which the IMF has looked at this last summer in August. And he argued in 1936 that the banks should lose the power to create money as debt, and we should create 100% money. Now it's called positive money. And the banks should not have any power to flip and you know, make uh, money out of debt. By 1939, he was supported by 235 economists, some very famous economists, and 157 universities supported, supported this plan. Now, how might that plan work today? Well, firstly, before I come on to that, let me say something about what did happen. What did happen in the Great Depression was something called cheap money, which is what is interesting. In the general theory of, 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 of Keynes, he, he outlined something called cheap money. So what Keynes said was that to get out of the problem that we're in, we should actually invest in public works. Uh, and, but also, to, we should actually have something to keep the banks from ever doing what they've done again by making sure that the interest rates on the public borrowing never exceeds that top rate, 2.5%. So in other words, and you, you'll see in a moment um, how cheap that really is. So these are for the gilt, so the, the long-term bonds that the government borrows. And he said, social investment is public investment. That's very core to the general theory. And the domestic economy uh, should be our focus. We should have fixed exchange rates, stop bank foreign lending with capital controls, and we should develop public banks. I'll come on to that. A lot of this wasn't really introduced until the Bretton Woods Agreement at the end of World War II. But that introduced something which has been called the golden age of capitalism. But what you see is, um, if you look, this is some figures from um, British research. Uh, the UK five-year gilt, the five-year bond market, if you look at the annualized return from 1899 to 2003, the annualized return was only 1.4%. So that for a long period of time there, the actual cheap money was in force. If you look at the annualized return since Reaganomics was kicked in, 7%. And that's, that's very expensive money. Okay, so um, you see, cheap money can, can work wonders. So, what is this? How is this? How would this work? Um, this is one example. I could give you many, but this is a good example. <clears throat> the problem with uh, the United States and the Great Depression uh, was that uh, the electrification had made its way to the cities, but rural areas in the United States didn't have electrification. Okay. Because the private electricity companies didn't want to pay for it because the, you know, because the transmission cost and the infrastructure was too much. Same problem we have today. The banks don't want to actually pay for green energy. They don't want to pay for renewables. They don't want to take the risk and they don't want to front up the, the capital. So we have the same problem today. So the solution that was, was found by <laughs> Roosevelt, because he sent a bunch of groups over to Scandinavia to go to Sweden and Finland and places like that, where they developed these rural electricity co-ops. And he wanted to figure out how they did it. And they came back after this think tank went over, and they developed this idea for an electrification of rural areas. And the way they did it was very good because they, they provided low-cost public finance to set up these rural electricity co-ops. And they gave them 10-year finance at 2%. 
And then it was so successful that by 1945, they rolled it over for another 10 years and they extended for another five years. So they had 25 year money at 2%. And that has actually been so successful that 42 million Americans are part of these rural, there's almost a thousand rural electricity co-ops in the United States. They've actually taken power to the people and, and, and um, it's the biggest uh, uh, energy cooperative movement in the world. Um, and they've now got this organization called Touchstone Energy. You can Google that. It's very interesting. We could do the same thing for renewable energy here, um, is, is what I'm saying, because uh, it's common sense. Um, but public banking is important to do this. And there's been a long history of public banking. The U early U.S. colonies, where they were revolting against the British, created their own public banks in m m the 13 original states. Um, European countries have developed uh, municipal savings banks and postal banks, um, uh, uh, privatized in lots of countries, unfortunately. But although not in uh, a lot of European countries, they still had municipal savings banks. In the United States, they set up a public bank uh, in 1932 called the Reconstruction Finance Corporation. And the Reconstruction Finance Corporation was the source of the 2% money for the electricity cooperatives in the rural areas. Germany, as part of the Marshall Plan, set up the KFW Bank, which is a public bank which still exists, and I'll come back to that in a moment. And in the prairies of Canada, the uh, social credit movement developed something called the Alter... Uh, it's called the Alternative Treasury Branch, which is also a public bank. Bank of North Dakota is a, a public bank. Bank of North Dakota is so successful that it's like the only state that doesn't have any debt. Of the 50 states in the United States, they don't have any public debt because they have a public bank. Um, so there's a campaign by um, at, uh, Ellen Brown to kind of get all American states to establish public banks. Um, they, are, they have been historically innovators in small business and housing lending. They're oriented to low interest lending and they use loan guarantees to reduce risk. The um, Merkel government, Christian Democrat conservative government in Germany, of course, decided about 18 months ago or two years ago um, after Fukushima to um, phase out nuclear power. So you've got bipartisan cross parliament support in Germany for going green. Uh, and of course, for them to phase out nuclear power, they not only have to continue to develop renewables, but they have to move to energy conservation. So the, the, the public development bank, KFW, is providing loans at like one, one and a quarter percent or one of the, you know, very low cost loans, so that people who are in small business or, in, or homeowners or tenants can get a green loan for 2.65%. If they save energy, they can get an interest rebate of maybe a half a percent. Okay? This has already created 247,000 jobs, and it's already upgraded 2.1 million homes in Germany. Why aren't we doing it here? Um, we ha have the development of a, of, a, of a small business development bank that Vince Cable is leading, so the, it, this could go in that direction. It should. But we could also use the state to issue currency. Um, it's been done before. It was done during the American Revolutionary War. It was very inflationary and not all that popular because they issued too much of it. But during the Napoleonic Wars, Britain, Brit Britain, Britain issued one and two uh, pound notes that were not backed by any borrowing. Um, they were just spending the money into the economy to, to fight Napoleon. During the World War I, at the very beginning, there were Bradbury notes issued for a little while, which were also uh, not by government borrowing. And during the American Civil War, Lincoln issued greenback dollars, which were very popular with farmers. Then they weren't actually backed by any government borrowing. The Central Bank of New Zealand and also the Central Bank of Canada, what you had in the Great Depression is you had the nationalization of private central banks. So that, this happened in a lot of countries. And then when those public banks were created as central banks, those central banks said, well, what do we do? How can we benefit the people? Because we're owned by the people. 
And for example, in New Zealand, they started making direct lending into infrastructure to create jobs and housing in 1935, and they continued doing it. In Canada, uh, they began direct lending um, as a public bank, not borrowing from the commercial banks, just direct lending to pay for World War II, to pay for uh, the St. Lawrence Seaway, to pay for public housing, to pay for the infrastructure, to pay pensions and social programs. And so by the late 1970s, Canada had hardly, hardly any um, uh, national debt. And then um, the Conservatives came in and they went for Reaganomics and started borrowing money uh, needlessly, and their debt has just gone you know, through the roof. So, you know, it can be done. Um, it has been done. It should be done. Why isn't it being done? It's because we don't have many people who are financially literate. Um, and you can't have financial democracy without financial literacy. And even, even though our politicians don't understand this, because they don't understand history, then we really have a problem. So, we could actually create, you know, because if, if they were literally investing, they were, they were spending the money into the economy and lending it out at an interest rate like the rate of inflation, that's interest-free lending, okay? We could do that directly here. We could do it as KFW or we could do it by quantitative easing, which we've already created $350 billion that's been spent into the economy, by investing directly in transition. It would be straightforward. James Robertson, uh, who was the key founder of New Economics Foundation, a wonderful man. I've learned so much from him over the years. Um, he's wrote a brilliant book, which I reviewed for, re for Resurgence uh, a couple of issues back, called Future Money. And this is, this is basically how uh, positive money would work. I mean, he wrote this, uh, uh, do people know positive money in the campaign? Yeah, okay. This is how positive money could really work. So as I said, the UK debt has soared from 300 billion to 1 trillion after 2008 um, for the bank bailouts. The annual interest cost is 43 billion, okay? Uh, our public pensions is 55 billion. That's public pensions and welfare costs, okay? Osborne, Osborne admits, uh, you know, that this figure is going to grow to 1.5 trillion by 2015. So be well in excess of our pension bill. That is madness. We need a so long release. Because if, if, it if the deficit continues to grow and grow and grow, then we will be like, the, you know, it will be like the olive oil crisis here. It's already happening in Greece again. And there's no jubilee release for the Greeks. So, Already, quantitative easing has injected 375 billion into the UK economy. We could, James has done the calculations. It's in the book. He wrote about this 10 years ago, in fact, um, when he did a mansion house, alternative mansion house speech that Ed Mayo organized in London. They've been working on this for a long time. So he does, and James Robertson set up the interbank research unit for the banks in London in the 70s. So he knows what he's talking about. <coughs> Implementing 100% money would yield a one-off windfall by switching the money over from debt-free, from debt-based money to debt-free money. It would yield 1.5 trillion. It would fully repay the public debt that is looming very fast, very soon. And it would yield an ongoing saving to the government of 75 billion here in this country, which could fund a citizen's income for all the citizens. All the citizens could have, you know, if the pension bill is, is, as I said to you, whatever, 55 billion. Here we could actually have, you know, we could actually have positive money creating a citizen's income for carers, for, you know, battered women, for all the social services, for all environmental work, for pensions, we could, it could really work. And it would be the opportunity for a steady state economy beyond growth with inclusive employment and a shorter working week for all, 20 hour a week. Let's go for it. <laughs> Think about this, there's no panacea. There's no one-trick pony. We need actually a kind of a, a, we have to get the horses together and we have to kind of go together. So, um, Mrs. Thatcher was famous for saying about Reaganomics, there is no alternative, Tina. That's what she loved to say. 
There is no alternative. There's no such thing as society. <laughs> um, but I say tapas. Yeah, I say tapas. I say there are plenty of alternatives, and they're very delicious. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> We have uh, uh, time banks, we have complementary currencies, we have the equivalent of labor notes today, but they're not very dynamic. Let's put a stamp on them. You know, let's, let's bring um, Gazellian stamp script in some electronic form, probably, not necessarily, um, here to Totnes. Let's create terminating building societies where people are saving for building their houses. And this is happening in Brazil. It's happening today. Um, I'll give you some examples in a moment, but in Brazil, there's an organization that I discovered from a friend a few, about a, a year ago called Coapab. And the way it works is exactly the way that the old terminating building size work here. The way it works in Brazil, you own a house, you organize a thousand people. You get them to commit to save for 10 years. Every year, somebody will draw numbers and somebody will actually get a house. So 100 people get housed in the first year, 200 people in the second year, and by 10 years, everyone has a house. Not a 25-year mortgage, 10 years. Works in Brazil. You know, let's learn from the Latinos. Um, you know, the Anglo-Saxons just kind of have lost the plot, I tell you. Um, so, they could be revived by our credit unions. We have, we have hundreds of credit unions in this country. We have 65 community loan funds. We could revive these today. Um, stamp script was dynamic, made illegal. We need to see how we can um, deal with that and make it happen again. Public banking is sound. It's working uh, in Germany, as I say, creating all these green jobs uh, for uh, conserver conserving energy. Uh, we, need, we need green employment. Let's, let's do it. Um, and we, we can go for 100% money. That's going to be a harder battle to win because that's out of our control uh, because we require the state to do it, to help us do it. We have to convince the politicians to make that happen. Keynes said in the general theory at the end, he says, I believe that the future will learn more from the spirit of Gazelle than from Marx. Interesting. Who were the jack interests? There's, there's a, so what happened in Denmark is that... Um, they, they, they did the uh, money, money system, and then that was banned. Um, and then they developed, in 1931, uh, in Denmark, and later in Sweden in 65, uh, JAK stands for Jort, Arbeit, Arbeit and Kapital, which means land, labor, and capital is, is, is the translation. Um, and the, that's the nature of the bank. So it was actually about land, labor, and capital as a cooperative bank. It started as cooperative loan societies like credit unions in a way in the Great Depression by farmers who were losing their homes to banks, private banks who were repossessing them. So they came up with this really interesting idea. It's like a, 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 similar to a, a community loan fund or a credit union. Members save at no interest and get secured loans at low management charge and fees. So it's like the terminating building society, but it's permanent. So it goes on and on and on. So the average loan cost is 2.5%. They have really no bad debt. They're using the system to finance um, renewable energy and, other, and social enterprises. And I've written a lot about it in the book. It's a whole chapter of the book about it. They've got 35,000 members in Sweden, 20 paid staff, and 300 regional volunteers. So it has that kind of volunteer element you find with credit unions. And the volunteers spend a lot of time promoting cooperative education to educate people that interest is a bad thing. That most people in most, in most societies will lose based on interest. If we move from an interest system, you know, everybody will be better off. And even the rich will actually be better off because the world will be safer and nicer and there will be less um, poverty and devastation and ec ecological destruction. So everybody wins, nobody loses. <clears throat> there are a, l a number of low-cost social finance systems that we've talked about in the book and that really people really should know more about because they're out there doing good work and they're not blowing their own trumpet enough. So for example, shared interest was started by a guy I know called Mark Hayes, uh, who worked with a venture capital firm called 3i. He's a Quaker though. 
had this Pauline conversion about 20 years ago. He got involved with free trade. And he developed a, 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 an organization called Shared Interest. Do you know it? Okay, Shared Interest is actually one of the major financiers of fair trade. Over there, they're doing the north-south loans, but they're actually getting people to go for low investment costs. So it's like crowdfunding in a way, but it's actually really, really successful. Organization based in not the city of London, but Newcastle on Tyne, uh, linked with Tradecraft. The Fund for Humanity was set up by some people in uh, the state of Georgia, uh, grew out of the civil rights movement, Christians in the South, um, and they were trying to provide uh, self-help loans to African Americans in the South initially for building their own houses. And they set up a thing called Habitat for Humanity, is a Christian-based movement. Uh, Jimmy Carter has supported it, and they actually they, they build houses Self-built. They're now working in 90 countries of the world, and they built 500,000 homes. Can you imagine that? Mm. That is a lot of homes. You know, that is the homes. That's like, uh, I mean, Birmingham, which you know is the, sec the second biggest city, would would have 250,000 homes, maybe or 300,000 homes. You know, that's bigger than Birmingham. You know, so this is a, you know, this is this is interest-free, okay, interest-free. Um, community development banks in Brazil. Uh, the central bank, I met one of the central bankers in Brazil last year, she came to NEF, <clears throat> and she, she was very involved in supporting this idea of Banco Palmas, which is one of the first ones, and so these community development banks have emerged with support and they make um, interest, some interest-free loans and local currency, uh, interesting one to look up on the web as well. <clears throat> and then in southern Germany, near uh, Austria border in the kind of Bavarian area, they began about 10 years ago reviving the Gazellian model, uh, experimenting with electric, negative interest money. And they, they, they had a lot of let schemes in Germany and they had a lot of complementary currencies. So they tried to kind of give it more dynamic, more velocity. And um, by speeding it up, they, they introduced a negative interest rate of 2% a quarter. So every three months, not every month, you have to pay 2% if you, you know, to revalidate it. But what's made it interesting is that they, they first introduced these hand notes, the hand, you know, hand to hand paper money, which looks nice and great. But then they, they were introducing smart cards and electronic forms. And, but they've made an alliance with the, the, the Triodos Bank in Germany, it's called GLS Gemeinschaft Bank. Uh, uh, that's, that, that bank is supporting it electronically so it can actually kind of scale up. Um, and so there are, there are 50 regional currencies in Germany approximately and 25 of them, half of them, have moved over to this Chingar system of negative interest. Um, here we have uh, community, community development finance organizations uh, and I've been working with some um, in the southwest, there's one called Wessex Home Improvement Loans, which is doing some very interesting work on very low interest loans for older people and poor people and repairing their houses. And they've made 100 million pounds of investment in the last five or six years, no bad debt. So, um, so last couple of slides. Okay. We have uh, uh, something like 3,000 plus microcredit organizations globally, over 130 million low income borrowers paying interest. Okay. Could we move those systems to interest free? Could we work with Kiva and, and, and crowdfunding of that sort to actually move them to this new idea because it, be, it would relieve poverty so much? That could be an interesting possibility. In the United States, there are 900 community development finance lenders um, um, and they, they've grown from 4 billion in assets to 40 billion in the last 10 years. In the UK, we have 65. Um, and about a billion pounds of assets in the UK. We've got community development credit unions in the States, which are a small part of the big credit union movement, but these are lending to the poorest people in rural and American, rural uh, urban areas in the United States. They're doing real uh, uh, community development banking in the poorest areas of the States. They're very interesting. We've got our social banks, whether it's Trade or Ecology Building Society, there's, a, there's at least 50 of them are members of NAs. Could we develop a fair trade banking movement? That's, that's a proposition. Could we get these social lenders to move towards these ideas? Because actually, 
it would enable them to really, really grow big. One interesting example as far as small businesses and medium-sized businesses is concerned, which is actually quite big. Has anyone heard of the Veer system? No? One or two people. Uh, it was inspired by the Jack in Denmark. Um, this Swiss um, co-op people who are followers of Gail Zell, they went to Denmark to look at the Jack loan system, interest-free. The farmers started in, in Denmark. They liked it. They tried to bring it... Uh, it brought some of the ideas back to Switzerland. And in 1934, they set up a mutual barter scheme to lend between small businesses in Zurich. Their turnover now is 1.2 Swiss, 1.2 million Swiss francs yearly. Sorry, that's, that's so, so they've got, got a few knots missing there. Uh, and it involves uh, 62,000 businesses. So it's all over Switzerland now. Uh, provides low cost working capital to business members who mutually own the Veer, which is actually a closed loop system, and they can get mortgages at 1.5% and 2.5% on working capital. So it's a really beautiful system uh, for small businesses, you know, lending to themselves with a complementary currency, uh, which they credit in this, this mutual credit system. So that could be a common project for fair trade banking, because a lot of the community loan funds in any part of Europe or, or US they do a lot of small business lending, so this could be a much better product for them. Uh, so we've had, of course, this movement because of the Occupy protests and so on and so forth, of uh, people moving their money. And the Huffington Post uh, is about say yes to community banking and no to Wall Street. You know, walk the talk. You know, move some of your money to a local lender. Um, you know, you know, practice what you preach. Um, and the U.S. is important because the community development lenders have formed a coalition 20 years ago and they were able to say, come to us. And so 650,000 new credit union accounts appeared out of the campaign and 50 million was transferred in one month. Uh, and Move Your Money campaign was launched last year in this country, so we have a Move Your Money campaign here. And more recently in London, I was part of the launch of something called the Community Investment Coalition to bring together under one roof all the credit unions, all the community development loan funds, plus all the complementary currencies, all the um, share issue people, you know, community share issue people, all under one umbrella to create one umbrella for hopefully fair trade banking in due course. Positive money obviously um, is moving forward with its, its work as well. So that's me finished. Over to you. Mm -hmm.